And then we're getting into points that also show up frequently here. These are points, Yonke, Pelican Lake, Vassant, uh, in particular, are points that are really associated with this area north of here in the you know, um, uh, southeastern Montana area. Uh, these guys were phenomenally good bison hunters. They were actively uh, uh, building um, uh, corrals to drive bison in. And um, in particular, Yonke, uh, interestingly, Frizen noted that Yonke uh, uh, kill sites, they weren't, they weren't making use of the bones at all. They weren't breaking bones. They were usually just cutting meat off and leaving with the meat, uh, which is sort of unique. Um, but they were, were <coughs> uh, very, very effective bison hunters. And they're living in a time frame climate climately that's uh you know it was moving out of a cold period into a warm period and it was probably like this you know moving out of the uh, uh this cold period into a warm period it was very likely um, wet and nice because of the population numbers during these these uh um, pelican lake and, and basant in particular yonke um, population numbers were definitely increasing there's lots and lots of these sites uh, Yonke Point was named for the Powers Yonke site uh, in Montana, not far from here again. And uh, the, some of them are very, very beautifully made. A lot of them are fairly casual. Most of these points, uh, whether they're Basant, uh, um, although there's some beautifully made Pelican Lake points, and there's some beautifully made Basant points too. But they're usually very, very functional. I mean, they, they work, uh, but they, don't, they didn't put a lot of uh, energy into making them, you know, uh, real nice for later collectors so they would appreciate them. <coughs> and interesting, the Pelican Lake point is one that I had one of the hardest times with trying to figure out really what made Pelican Lake. Um, the original Pelican Lake points um, are gone. Uh, they're, they're, they aren't to be found anywhere. But the, uh, the original drawings of them, these resemble the original. This one is very, very close to the original Pelican Lake point. And it's um, uh, probably there's a lot of points that are identified as Pelican Lake like these from Cobalt that probably aren't Pelican Lake. You know, where they, where they fit in, time-wise, they're probably contemporaneous. But, but technologically, these are not the same as these points at all. But because that's generally what's accepted, I just, uh, you know, I just, I just went along with that, but, I, but, but only grudgingly. Pelican Lake points originally have very, very narrow necks and very elongated blades. Um, uh, and, and there may be, you know, other types of corner notch points on the plains that should be identified, you know, as, as complexly different. But unfortunately, they're all sort of lumped. If it's a corner notch point on the plains, it's a pelican lake. And I'm not sure that that's fair. Uh, during the pelican lake time period is when you start to see, um, you know, uh, the base tang knives and uh, corner tang knives and back tang knives. These, again, almost always have a beveled edge on them. These were not for hafting. These uh, probably had a wrist strap on them. Um, if you can imagine just how handy it might be to, you know, if you're skinning a bison or something, to be able to, you know, pull on the hide and reach and grab a, you know, the knife rather than, uh, uh, you know, dropping it down and, and maybe losing it in the sand or the snow. Uh, almost all uh, uh, tang knives are ground actually very heavily right here, which is an indication that they were actually holding the knife by hand and using their, you know, their, their finger on top of that you know, for leverage. These are not common on the plains. As you move south on the plains, these become more and more and more common. By the time you get into Oklahoma and Texas, for example, they're quite common. But on the plains, they show up first with Pelican Lake points. These are other examples. Uh, uh, these, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, were from a private collection on the uh, um, west side of the big points. These are Bassant points. Uh, this is from the Ruby site, which is here. And um, uh, once again, they're not beautiful points. They're very, very effective. Uh, but, you know, whereas it takes probably, uh, you know, an Eden napper may take, you know, more than two hours to make a point. Any, you know, competent napper can make a Basant point in, you know, less than 10 minutes. Uh, they're very, you know, expedient points. They're not difficult to make. There are some that were made quite beautifully, uh, and I don't know why. Um, because it doesn't even look like the same technology. One explanation is that the Basant people, particularly along the Missouri River, um, had um, a lot of exposure to Hopewell people from Ohio. The, the Hopewellian people from Ohio at this same time frame were actually traveling from Ohio up the Missouri River 
uh, to get Knife River Flint in North Dakota and all the way to Montana uh, and Wyoming to get Obsidian out of Yellowstone. And it's clear that uh, at a certain time period, these Bissant people that, that had uh, exposure to the Hopewell people began making burial mounds and they started you know, copying some of the aspects of Hopewell people. And uh, if you can imagine, they were, they were probably the equivalent of some you know, city folk coming in with fancy cars and they were probably tattooed and coiffed and you know, the people in the plains were you know, necessarily living a lot more simply and uh, frugally in, in their <coughs> meager existences here. They may have been pretty impressed with some of these, uh, these, these city folk coming in from Ohio and they did copy them. Um, and, and it's possible that some of the song points that are beautifully made may not actually be some of the song points, they may actually have been hopo <coughs> points. And there's, um, there's, there's some argument as to whether you know, people traded that material to the Hopewell in Ohio or whether they actually came and got it. But as a general rule, when you see exotic materials far from their source um, and it was traded, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you see a piece of Yellowstone obsidian in eastern North Dakota, you're generally going to see you know, a little tiny crooked arrow point or something out of it, not something really large. You know, it, it seems like these, these major pieces, um, uh, the best pieces got traded close and the, the smaller ones got traded as you went farther and farther and farther away. And, and Hopewell were making enormous big blades out of Knife River Flint and Yellowstone Obsidian. Uh, so there's, there's a real good chance that they were actually traveling from Ohio to this region to get the material. And the other thing is, is that twice now I've seen Hopewell points uh, along the Missouri River, but not in context or from collections that were dependable enough to, you know, to make, make a claim that they were doing that. These are Bassant knives. Uh, you can see these. These are actually in the museum. Uh, Bassant knives are, are asymmetrical. Uh, George reads these differently, uh, but some Bassant knives are just so, you know, so much at an angle um, that uh, I, I think there's just no question that they may have been used as projectile points first, um, but I think that they were also used as knives and sharpened asymmetrically afterwards. Uh, 